Imagine a world where half the people in it are denied many rights. Where they can't have particular jobs. They can't sit on a jury. They can't run for political office. They can't even vote. That's the world Muriel McQueen Ferguson was born into. But it's a world she was destined to change. Muriel Florence Elizabeth McQueen was born in 1899 in Shediac, New Brunswick. Her father was a lawyer. Her mother, a typical Victorian matron. Well, both parents had political and social influence in the region. Muriel went to public school and graduated from high school with average marks. Then, she followed the path of other upper-class girls. She attended Ladies College at Mount Allison University in Sackville. But that wasn't enough for a woman with such an independent spirit. After the first year, I realized that I wanted to be enrolled in university courses rather than in the finishing school for wives in training. At Mount A, Muriel met the man she would eventually marry, Aubrey Ferguson. I fell in love with Aubrey, um, but I also had in my mind that I wanted to have a career. I wanted to be a lawyer myself. She wanted to be a lawyer at a time when there were only a handful of female lawyers in Canada. There were even fewer in New Brunswick. When my mother learned this and realized that I was going to be married as soon as my husband could support me, she objected to spending all that money to send me to Dalhousie. And I couldn't, I couldn't disagree with her. Certainly that was the feeling of people at that time. They didn't spend that much money on their girls. You know, it was not going to be useful. And my father told me that if I really wanted to, that I could study law in his office and take the bar examinations in Fredericton. In 1924, Muriel McQueen and her fiancé were admitted to the bar. They married two years later. The wedding write-up in the local newspaper portrayed the couple as A.S. Ferguson, a barrister, and Muriel McQueen, a popular Shediac girl. The newlyweds moved up the St. John River to northwestern New Brunswick, Grand Falls. There, Aubrey practiced law. Muriel stayed home. But she kept busy in the community. They all appreciated everything she did, everything she tried to do, and everything she started, which was the uh, girl guides. And she was well-liked. She was a family person. But this family person was also trained as a lawyer, and she grew frustrated. It was not considered really a possibility for me to practice law with my husband at that time. I was either a wife or a, a partner. Aubrey Ferguson had a heart condition. By the mid-1930s, it worsened and he couldn't keep up with his practice. This became a turning point for Muriel. She decided to take over her husband's law practice. I started to advise people that came in and they thought that my husband was advising me what I should do. I was really staying up half the night trying to learn what was the correct thing to do. While practicing law in Grand Falls, Muriel Ferguson made her first mark as a pioneer. In 1935, she was appointed judge of the probate court, 
the first time a woman had ever held such a position in New Brunswick. Only 30 years earlier, a woman in New Brunswick couldn't become a lawyer, much less a judge. The male judges on the province's highest court ruled that a woman couldn't possibly practice law because she was not a person. It was shortly after my husband had died. I was living in Grand Falls, and I thought I would like to get something to do away from Grand Falls because I wasn't very happy there without him. And uh, so a friend came in from Montreal, and I was telling him my problems and that I'd looking for something to do. And he said that he knew of a very good position that he knew that I had qualifications for. It was a good, a nice firm, a large firm in Montreal. And uh, he suggested that uh, I write to them and tell them that I was available. So I um, did. And at that time, I used the signature of M. M. C. Q. Ferguson. And uh, so it doesn't show if I was a man or a woman. It was no special reason. I just, that was the way I signed my name. And uh, so I got a reply from the firm saying that they were very interested in my, what I, my application. And uh, they were going to give me a call on the telephone. But when they called me on the telephone and heard my voice, they said, you're not a woman. And I said, yes, I am. And uh, the answer was, well, we're sure that our board would not ha give this kind of a position to any woman lawyer. So there's no use going any further. So that was that. But times were changing for men and for women. The Second World War determined that. As men headed overseas to fight in Europe, women found new jobs to support the war effort. They worked on assembly lines and in offices. Muriel McQueen Ferguson found yet another non-traditional job in St. John. She became assistant enforcement counsel with the Wartime Prices and Trade Board. She was most adept at obtaining her objectives without any hint of confrontation, without any hint that she's pushing herself forward. In time, Muriel helped find her boss, the chief enforcement counsel, a new job. When he left, she got his job. As enforcement counsel, I uh, wasn't responsible for rationing. And if people uh, didn't, I mean, if they weren't entitled to things, I could prosecute them. Gone are the days when rubber could be bought for pleasure cars. Now every pound is needed for military uses. At that time, tires, rubber and tires were rationed. And in order to get new tires, you had to get a permanent. So after her tires were worn out, she, she started coming to work on a bicycle. And some of the men in the office thought it was very improper for a lady in her position to be riding a bicycle. And they told her, you could easily get a permit. But she said, no, I will not use my position to get a permit when, when most people just can't get tires. And so she continued to use her bike. After the war, when the men came home, many women returned to their traditional roles, but not Muriel McQueen Ferguson. She joined the Business and Professional Women's Club. In this group, she mastered her lobbying and networking skills. When she found it necessary to lobby for worthy causes, then she often called on those groups. And those groups, those, that women's network, often responded with protests and, and petitions. Muriel used the networks effectively in 1945 when housewives in Fredericton couldn't vote in municipal elections. She did some research, drafted a brief on their behalf, went with them in and presented the brief to the city council. And as a result, the legislation was changed and women became then eligible to vote. Muriel McQueen Ferguson also used those networks to fight a battle over employment equity. She had responded to an ad for a job with the Department of National Health and Welfare. Then I noticed that it said that it was open only to male residents of New Brunswick, or I think Pembroke, Nova Scotia too, I'm not sure. And I, I 
that didn't let the stop me stop me stop me. I wrote a letter and said that I could do that job, and I, but I wasn't a man. However, I don't think the letter had a, anybody paid any attention to that. However, I, I now had become quite interested in the Business and Professional Women's Club, and they're looking for equality for women. And my friend, Dr. Lawson, was the president. So I got in touch with her, and I showed her the application. And she, of course, was very excited. And uh, she uh, sent a telegram to the national president of the Business and Professional Women's Club. She also got in touch with the um, New Brunswick presidents of other women's organizations. And they were interested and supported this too, so they got in touch with their head offices. And the government got a lot of protest letters saying they didn't mention my name. They only said that there was an, ad, uh, an advertisement for this position, um, and it was limited to men. But there were women in New Brunswick who could fill that position and had the proper qualifications. And so, not very long after, uh, the uh, advertisement was recalled, and a new one was set out. Muriel eventually got the job. She was the first female regional director of family allowances for New Brunswick. It was only a matter of time before Muriel's lobbying and networking would push her into another field dominated by men, politics. In 1951, she became the first female alderman in Fredericton. She won the seat by acclamation. In December of 1951, Alderman Ferguson vehemently opposed a bill that would have limited pay increases to female employees to $50, while their male counterparts were eligible for a $100 increase. Alderman Ferguson pointed out that salary increases should not be based on gender, but should be based on qualification. As a result, Council gave first reading to a motion that did not limit pay increases to the individual because they were a man or a woman, but based on qualification, and everything from that point forward became equal. I think that's probably what she's best remembered for. Muriel spent two years on city council, gaining the political experience that would serve her well in her next job as a member of the Senate of Canada. In 1953, Liberal Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent named Muriel the first female senator from the Atlantic provinces. I went to my office and I called in all my staff. And I wanted to tell them that I would be leaving. And they were very interested. And one girl said, oh, I know. I know what you're going to tell us. You're going to get married. And I said, oh, no, much better than that. I'm going to be called to the Senate. Muriel McQueen Ferguson's ability to fight for and to promote women's rights was encouraging to young women. It gave them hope. My first recollection of a meeting with Senator Ferguson was in 1954 when I was 19 years old. And she had w received an honorary degree along with other distinguished women. So I attended that convocation. And when I listened to what she had done with her life, which was very non-traditional, for women particularly uh, in the early part of the, of the uh, 20th century, but also for those of us in the 50s who were really still living by a very restricted uh, definition of what a woman should do and what a woman should be. And Senator Ferguson was moving off and doing things that were really uh, uh, mind-boggling to a 19-year-old girl, and so I was extremely impressed. In 21 years as a senator, Muriel McQueen Ferguson made speech after speech to the predominantly male Senate and the Canada they represented. She spoke of how unfair it was that Canada's laws treated women differently than men. When I was appointed to the Senate, uh, the, uh, the Senate had to consider all cases of divorce uh, that came from Quebec and, uh, oh, I forget the other one, was Newfoundland. it Newfoundland? Yes, yes. Newfoundland. 
sometimes the women, of course, would be called to give evidence in a case, you know, where they were looking for a divorce. And, and uh, I have had many of them t say to me, you don't know how wonderful it was to go into that room full of old or men, important men, and see a woman sitting yes. there. Yes, yes. And uh, they were so glad <laughs> that the, at least they would have one woman to sympathize with. Yes, yes, yes. That was one thing I thought was well worthwhile. Yes. But it, it was a lot of work. Throughout her career as a senator, Muriel fought discrimination in the courts, where women were not allowed to sit on a jury. In the 50s, she persuaded the New Brunswick government to modify its laws. But it took nearly 20 years for her to bring about real change and equality at the national level. Apart from her, women who were raped would still not be able to go before the courts of this country. Women who were beaten would still not be able to go before the courts of this country because they would face an all-male jury. I think that everybody in this country owes that. When Muriel also was on the Poverty Committee, which was one that was established in the Senate, and it was traveling across this country, that committee was sitting in big hotels and places that were very intimidating. It was Muriel who said, let's go to the homes of the people. She couldn't get that through at first, so that she started going out herself. And the idea was so good, so successful, that the result was that the Poverty Committee itself then began to go into the homes of people to find out what was happening. As she pushed for equal rights for women, Muriel McQueen Ferguson tackled many of Canada's institutions, government, the courts, and the church. My relationship with Senator Ferguson began when I first came here to Fredericton as dean of, this, of the cathedral in 1960. She didn't always agree with what she might have heard from the pulpit, but uh, she would um, express that uh, and then sort of chuckle and say, uh, you know, uh, you may not agree with I do, what I do either. Um, that was sort of the basis of our relationship. Probably the, the, the one question in which she expressed some considerable displeasure, and probably rightly so from her point of view, was over the action of the church uh, in, in deciding to ordain women. And our diocesan policy of not implementing that immediately and she did resent that very much. Each cause she took up raised her profile and made her more influential. Muriel and other women in the Liberal Party called on Prime Minister Lester Pearson to pay more attention to the role of women in society. In the mid-1960s Pearson responded by setting up a royal commission on the status of women. There will be a great many things to be investigated, including uh, the legal position of, of women in various aspects of life to make sure that they are equal legally and, and in every other respect with men. Miriam McQueen Ferguson was a very dedicated and determined person. Uh, the success of her life uh, depicts that. Some would say that Muriel resembled her father, much like her father, but I think she was more like her mother. Her mother was a very determined person as well. In fact, their home in Shediac um, has an, a unique story to it because at one time the main entrance was on a side street and her mother didn't like that and she kept pestering about this side street entrance. One day the town woke up and here was a construction company lifting the house up, turning it around, so the front door is on Main Street. And I guess Muriel has been turning things around ever since. Before she retired from active politics, Muriel McQueen Ferguson would have another first in a remarkable career. For more than a hundred years, the people whose portraits adorned these walls shared one thing in common. They were men. But in 1972, Muriel McQueen Ferguson broke that tradition. She became the first female Speaker of the Senate of Canada. Gentlemen Usher of the Black Rod, you will proceed to the House of Commons and acquaint that House that it is the pleasure of His Excellency, the Governor-General of Canada, 
that they attend him immediately in the Senate chamber. I would say that, uh, that uh, uh, Senator Ferguson was one of my best bosses. I was the youngest uh, person ever appointed to, uh, to head the library. And I was rather abrasive. Uh, I was anxious to get things done and do things my way and so forth. And uh, uh, Speaker Ferguson was a much more experienced and uh, uh, sensible person than I. And charming, too, I, I must say. Uh, so after one uh, political exchange, he, he sent me this little note, which I see it's September of 73, and she reminds me, I always believe molasses catches more flies than vinegar. As one of the top four ranked officers of Canada, she entertained many distinguished visitors. In her lifetime, she has received honorary degrees, awards, and appointments as Queen's Counsel, Privy Counsel, and Officer of the Order of Canada. She is the patron of many organizations, including the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Foundation on Family Violence. I admire her because she is such a gentle, caring, considerate person. And she has achieved so much as an activist, and she has achieved so much as a decision maker. And yet she conducts herself with so much dignity and so much humility that her presence by itself fills the room and enables others to follow her leadership. That's the sign of a true leader. Historians may well argue into the 21st century whether Muriel McQueen Ferguson had an agenda or whether she really did make it up as she went along. But through her actions, she helped and inspired generations of women in New Brunswick and in the rest of Canada. Muriel McQueen Ferguson is timeless. Muriel McQueen Ferguson is dynamic. Uh, she's uh, an inspiration. I think one of her greatest achievements would be the ability to remain humble, even after all her life entailed. But still, she's the same woman that goes out and weeds the garden as the same woman that was Speaker of the Senate. Muriel McQueen Ferguson was among the very, very first women to give Canadians, Canadian women in particular, a voice at the national level. Muriel Ferguson is a pioneer, is a bridge builder, which made it much easier for future women to enter politics. Someone who understands the fabric of the Canadian identity. Muriel McQueen Ferguson is, without question, the most energetic 90-year-old kid in this country. Muriel McQueen Ferguson is a national treasure and a great Canadian. Well, I think I'd like to be remembered as someone who had something to do with the uh, increasing recognition of the equality of women in New Brunswick and in Canada. <laughs>